Hi, and welcome to the 101 Art Observation Virtual Lecture Series. This series is delivered by the Satellite Applications Catapult in partnership with Wild Labs. This lecture is about how do I get started with remote sensing data? And uh, we will start looking which are the public mission available up there and related data. This series of slide, slides, it's, it's, it's uh, shaped as we see here. So where we got like our mission, uh, a picture of the satellite and uh, a remote sensing image over a specific area. In this case, the area it's, uh, uh, it's in, in Bolivia, uh, in, a, in a region called Salardo Uni, that's a salt lake over there. And we see this like uh, uh, in, in white and, and blue with the surrounding all around. What we see here has been generated in Google Earth Engine, which is a platform which I will mention in, in the next video. So uh, the first, first mission, uh, it's a very important one, which is called Landsat 8. Uh, that's a multispectral mission with 11 bands, uh, with a repeat cycles of 16 days since 2017. Resolution of the, uh, of the, of the, of the missions, special resolution of the mission, it depends on the bands and it varies from 15 meters for the panchromatic bands to 30 meters to uh, 100 meters. 100 meters refers to the uh, thermal portion of the, of, the, of the spectrum, so related to temperature. That's why potential products here includes surface temperature. Recently, uh, the Landsat 9 mission has been launched um, with similar, similar characteristics. Another optical mission, Sentinel-2, again multispectral, uh, 13 bands. In this case, the uh, repeat cycle is, is shorter, uh, five days uh, since 2017, and the resolution is also slightly better with uh, 10 meters over, over um, four bands, 20 and 60 meters. Potential products, again, that are all around vegetation, soil, uh, water, and, and, and others. All the applications that I've shown in the lecture about um, uh, passive remote sensing application can actually, you know, be, be written there. Another mission, it's called Aster. So this is another multispectral mission, 14 bands, um, with several bands here in the, in the shortwave infrared band. So this is quite, quite useful for geological analysis, as I explained in a previous video. A repeat cycle 16 days and a resolution of um, 15 to uh, 90 meters. This mission has been um, dismissed, but uh, data is always av available. Hyperion uh, or EO1. So uh, this is an hyperspectral mission. So we have a larger number of bands. So we pass from uh, 15, 13, 16 to 220. Um, 16 days of repeat pass resolution of uh, 30 uh, meters. Potential products, uh, geological analysis, but also vegetation uh, and everything re uh, related to hyperspectral. Maybe just a note. So we see here that uh, we have only a, a two, two strips here and we don't have full coverage. This is because this mission um, doesn't provide a full coverage of the Earth, but it provides coverage only on selected areas. The other hyperspectral mention that emission that I mentioned uh, in a previous slide, it's called Prisma. Um, again, uh, with a large number of bands, 250 bands, repeat cycle of 29 days, resolution similar to um, Hyperion, 30 meters, and potential products that, that, range, that range from geological analysis, but also uh, vegetation and uh, uh, you know, everything, everything that can be done with, with hyperspectral data, pollution and so on. MODIS is another uh, very popular mission, multispectral, larger number of bands, 36. Repeat cycle in this case is, is shorter, one, two days, but the spectral resolution is coarser. So we are talking of 250 to one, one kilometer. So this is quite good because of the, uh, of the resolution and the repeat cycles to see large scale dynamics of, of, of the Earth. If we move to SAR data, Sentinel-1, it's a radar mission with, uh, with two polarizations. 
Repeat pass is 12 days since 2016 and resolution is, that's not a square, let's say, a pixel, so is in average is 10 meters, but in reality is 20 meters by about 20 meters by about 5 meters. Potential products, they're all the products that I explained uh, in the previous, in the previous, uh, you know, application deck. What we see over here, so I, I mentioned, I mentioned in a, in a, in a video that SAR data is, is black and white. So to color, in this case, the data, uh, we have done a, a color composite uh, on with, where we use the different polarization that are within the Sentinel-1 mission to create that sort of, sort of picture. Topography, so SRTM, it's a, it's a topographical uh, mission. Um, it provides with a digital elevation model of the, of the Earth um, that's actually bounded at plus minus 60 uh, degree of uh, uh, latitude uh, with a resolution of 30 meters. Similarly, um, ALOS or AW3D30 it's a topographical mission with similar characteristic. Another multispectral uh, mission that has, I mentioned it because it, it, has, it has been used to derive uh, a product, a land cover product, which is like shown in the, in, in the bottom, it's called Proba, um, and it's, it has a repeat cycle of, of one day uh, with the resolution of 300 to 600 meters. Again, the land cover has been derived with that. Uh, the land, a land cover product has been derived with that sensor. Another land cover um, has been derived with MERIS, so multispectral data, 15 bands, 3 days, resolution of 300, 300 uh, meters. So the name of this cover is actually called Globe Cover. Weather data, uh, a mission that it's worth mentioning is the uh, GPM mission, Global Precipitation Measurement. Um, so repeat cycle in this case is three hours. So this is used to detect precipitation uh, every three hours again. And the resolution is uh, five kilometers, spectral resolution, sorry, spatial resolution. Um, final mission that I want to mention is uh, SBAP. So another radar mission, three days repeat cycle, resolution of 36 kilometers. So this mission has been used specifically to derive soil moisture product. So this concludes the, uh, the, um, the public you know, sensor, sensor overview. Again, I want to stress this, all this data is actually publicly available uh, through different platforms as I will show in the next videos. Hi, and welcome to the 101 Earth Observation Virtual Lecture Series. This series is delivered by the Satellite Applications Catapult in partnership with Wild Labs. This lecture is about two specific missions, the Sentinel and the Landsat mission. Sentinel missions. Um, so this is part of the whole concept of, uh, of mission from the European Space uh, Agency, also called Copernicus. So there are different, different sensors here uh, that, that they are named with numbers. So from Sentinel-1 to Sentinel-6. Those specific missions, they have different technology, uh, such as radar, uh, optical, um, atmospheric, altimetry, and so on. We will see this more in detail in the next few slides. Sentinel-1. Sentinel-1, uh, it's a SAR mission with a special resolution of about 20 by 5 meters and a temporal resolution of 6 to 12 days. The SWOT width is quite large, so we are talking of uh, 250 uh, kilometers. Main applications are listed there. Um, again, we are moving from uh, monitoring sea ice, land ice, oil spill, land use change, land deformation, support to emergency, flooding, earthquakes, and so on. All the data is publicly available, and it's quite uh, impressive to see that at the end of 2020, about 6 million products have been generated and made available for download, with a total of 10 petabytes. More than 30 million Sentinel-1 product downloads have been made by users, represented 40 petabytes. 
Sentinel-2 is the multispectral mission of, um, of, of, of the Sentinels. So the spatial resolution depends on the band, uh, 10 to 60 meters. We will see a bit more in detail. A temporal resolution, five days, what uh, with 290 kilometers. Main application, there they also vary here from agriculture to forest, disaster mapping, uh, uh, water quality, and so on. As of July 2020, 20 million products have been generated and made available for download with a total of 10 petabytes. So as you see, we are talking of very large amount of data. I move uh, to the Landsat mission because it's, it's comparable, let's say, to Sentinel-2. So uh, Landsat is again a multispectral, multispectral mission. Landsat is the pillar of remote sensing. So um, we can say that almost everything started with, uh, with, with it. So we can go back in the 70s with Landsat 1 and um, that there is a there is an evolution of sent of Landsat sensors up to Landsat 9 which has been launched and made available uh, you know that has been made available recently in this figure um, yeah we can see also also Landsat Landsat 9 um, so there is a continuity of data here from the 70s to to nowadays with only a part in the middle with some um, issues on, on the sensors with Landsat 7, uh, where continuity um, uh, has not been actually uh, maintained for that specific uh, sensors, but for uh, previous sensors. Um, Google Earth. Google Earth was launched in 2005 uh, with satellite imagery from the Landsat 7 mission. So we almost all know what is Google Earth and uh, um, that specific mission is used in Google Earth to represent data. Google Earth was democratizing remote sensing by having uh, like a view of the Earth and uh, like an easy, let's say also, uh, you know, manipulation and an easy, uh, you know, um, description of the Earth made available to the public for free in a super easy way, just with our browser. It's useful to compare Sentinel to a Landsat 8 uh, because they're similar in terms of like objectives. Uh, and what we see here, they're the different bands uh, from, uh, from Landsat 8 uh, compared to Sentinel 2. Um, specific and Landsat 7 as well. Specifically at the top of this figure we have like all the different bands in Sentinel-2 and in the middle we have Landsat 8. Some peculiarities here. So um, we can see how Landsat 8 has some bands that Sentinel-2 doesn't have. So for example the thermal bands which are the bands 10 and 11 the, in red as well as the panchromatic band, the band number 8. But Sentinel-2 Two as a better representation of the uh, red edge part of the spectrum with bands um, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8, 8. So this, this portion of the spectrum is much more, much more described while Landsat has only, uh, has only one band over there. So although the two sensors are quite similar in terms of uh, being multispectral with, the, um, with more or less the same number of bands, the fact that the bands do not overlap, they are different in, in terms of like uh, um, resolution and in terms of like presence in the spectrum, make the two actually quite complementary. So it's good to use Sentinel-2 for some studies and Landsat-8 for some other study. So it's up to the user to decide, uh, you know, which sensor to, uh, to use. So we go back to Sentinel. Uh, Sentinel-3, uh, it's a multispectral SR altimeter. Um, man so there are two basically, two basically different technology. Um, the temporal resolution, it's one, two days for the uh, multispectral one with a SWOT width of um, around 300 kilometers, so it's quite, quite large. We can see application, application written here. So they're all around, uh, for example, uh, screening the ocean and also the land surface to get like information about biology, but also provide reliable information on the atmosphere uh, and the aerosol characterization. 
Um, the altimeter can be used to study ocean topography, like mean sea level, wave height, wind speed over the surface, ocean currents, and, and so on. So there are, there are quite, quite a lot of applications here that can be you know, triggered with Sentinel-3 data. Sentinel-5P, uh, it's another multispectral data that is used to derive um, atmospheric components, specifically uh, ozone, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, methane, and, and, and so on, and formal delight. Um, air quality, generally speaking. Uh, so this is, this is very, very, um, very used to, to derive, to derive, you know, climate change type of uh, type of study forecasting and uh, and so on so they're all products that they actually come directly as uh, you know geolocated uh, version of those specific components hello and welcome to the 101 Earth observation virtual lecture series this series is delivered by the satellite applications catapult in partnership with wild labs this lecture is about Earth observation derived products which are publicly available. As I mentioned in previous videos, Earth observation data is used to derive information. This information can come in form of products um, and some of those products that are actually already there, available to the public, so without the need of like processing data to derive that specific product. I have taken this list from uh, Google Earth Engine, um, which has like a large repository of Earth observation derived products, and we'll go through them uh, one by one. So derived products can, can, can be relative to vegetation, such as the PMLV2, which uh, uh, includes evotranspiration product at 500 meters at 8 day resolution, or uh, topography, uh, such as topographical properties such as landform, uh, like classified peaks, slope, valleys, as well as topographical shading and so on from uh, ALOS or SRTM. Still on the topography, um, we have products such as uh, the uh, MTPI, which uh, is used to distinguish ridge from valley forms uh, at 270 meter resolution. Topographic diversity, so a variety of temperature and moisture condition available to species uh, as local habitats. Um, vegetation, again, so or forests, GLCF, so this is the Landsat 3 cover continuous field, um, which contains estimate of the percentage of horizontal ground in 30 meter pixel covered by woody vegetation greater than 5 meters in height at three different times. Water, uh, same, uh, same, same product, but uh, Landsat Global in Inland uh, Water, so which describes surface water bodies. Um, again, forest, non-forest, so uh, in this case from Pulsar 2, um, so Pulsar 2, it's, it's a SAR, uh, SAR type of data, so uh, there is a product such as the forest, non-forest uh, map, Water again, GRC, so this is all in alphabetical order, so the, the sort of mix between different uh, disciplines. So uh, GRC, um, which is like the global surface uh, water mapping uh, layers, so with the location and temporal distribution of surface water from 1984, so quite a long time ago, to 2018. Monthly, 30 meter resolution. Modis. Uh, has a lot of products associated to the mission, such as land cover type um, with, uh, with the 500 meters yearly global description of the land, um, as well as the dynamics, uh, so which is like, um, you know, the, 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 the onset of greenness, the uh, maturity peak, uh, senescence, and, 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 and so on. Still on Modis, leaf are index product at 500 uh, meters. Temperature, uh, surface temperature uh, at one kilometer from Terra Aqua is another uh, is another uh, available product, as well as water mask uh, at 250 meter. 
Another one here is the GLDAS, which is the Global Land Data Assimilation System with several land surface parameter at 30 kilometers, but every three hours. You can, you can appreciate here you now the, the trade-off between resolution and, and, and time. So the timelier we are, usually the coarser the resolution. Global Forest Canopy, um, it's at 90 meter resolution, canopy height, sorry, um, and also uh, forest change uh, at 30 meter resolution. In, this is called the Hansen Global Forest Change. And in the middle, we have another product of leaf area index and uh, um, absorb photosynthetically active radiation. Uh, this, is, this is actually uh, a, an interesting one since it's, it's again since 1981 uh, captured daily at five kilometers. There are several products from uh, WWF linked to um, hydrosheds. Uh, so hydro hydrologically uh, derived parameters such as the hydrologically conditioned dam, the drainage direction. In this slide there is actually at the beginning also another product, uh, the WCMC product on um, below um, uh, ground biomass. So WWF, as I was mentioning, has several products uh, linked to the hydrology, hydrosheds, flow accumulation, hydroshed basin level, hydroshed free flowing river networks. And um, as, I, as I explained, so there are different products here that are already available to the user to be downloaded and to be inspecting. So those are all freely available, uh, freely accessible and uh, um, they are really touching different aspects of and these different disciplines as we have seen from agriculture to forestry to topography to hydrology and so on. Hello and welcome to the 101 Earth Observation Virtual Lecture Series. This series is delivered by the Satellite Applications Catapult in partnership with Wild Labs. This lecture is about data access and processing. We will see this in two different uh, aspects, public uh, data access and processing platform and partially public. So I have shown in previous video uh, that there are different Sentinel missions. How do we actually get this data? The first platform where we can get data, it's called the Copernicus Open Access Hub or C Hub, and the website is over there. Landsat data on the other side uh, can be downloaded directly through the USGS platform, which is called Earth Explorer. So this platform, they usually require uh, user registration, but then data can be really easily downloaded. And there is a geographical, uh, you know, overview over there where you usually select the area of interest, the time as well, where we want data capture, and then we simply download data. This specific platform has several other data associated, not only Landsat, as we see uh, in, the, in the right. Uh, SAR data, uh, Sentinel-1 data, can be downloaded as well uh, uh, through the Alaska Satellite Facility, ASF. The platform is here. This is useful not only to download data, but to get also some additional products derived with this data and some tools. Copernicus Global Land Service, so this provides free open access data uh, and uh, it provides with different type of products uh, which describe the state and evolution of the vegetation, water cycle and so on. So there are different products associated here. Again, website is marked in the slide. Another platform with different products is called Thematic Exploitation Platform, TEP. Um, so uh, this, is, this is linked to um, several, several products from the emergency uh, side, such as we've seen this example, for example, a flooding, a flooding in, Geo in, uh, in Germany, to more earth science product and, and, and so on. Another platform is called Earth System Data Lab or Earth in a Box, uh, where we get a multiple varied data set of Earth system variables in a, in a sort of a, uh, you know, a, a cube 
as 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 in this in this slide. I mentioned in a previous video about ARD analysis ready data. Let's let's have a look here a bit more in detail because some of those platforms they actually uh, mention specifically analysis ready data. So analysis ready data are biogeophysical measurements on Earth that are comparable through space and time. So um, they're built usually in data cubes and uh, every point in the cube corresponds to a specific geographical location consistently. It's not yet standardized as a concept and sci uh, scientific group, uh, several groups exist now to, to, to define the specification of analysis ready data because several processing steps can be performed to get to get that specific uh, processing. But I think it's important to mention the name so that, uh, you know, we are familiar, we are familiar with it. And generally speaking, this is very good when we want to do a large scale automated analysis through both inter and intrasensor interoperability. DataCube, which is, uh, I mentioned just before, it's where we can store, for example, analysis ready data. The Open Data Cube, what you see, it's a Python library uh, that supports applications uh, that facilitate working with large volume of raster data. So this is just a set of Python tools to create, to create um, cubes. If you move into processing, uh, Sentinel Applications Platform or Snap, it's a set of open access toolboxes to open, display, and process earth observation data. Um, so this is quite a comprehensive um, software uh, which performs lots of processing. So I have shown in previous video, you know, some, some of the products uh, that we can derive with earth observation data. This software can be used to derive some of those product, products. So it's useful to process data. I mentioned also about GIS, which uh, um, which which was an important part of uh, of uh, uh, you know of, of the use of, of Earth observation and geospatial data to create maps and everything around around it. One of the most popular uh, open access software uh, is called QGIS, and it's freely available. It's probably probably uh, worth mentioning that there are several plugins here that are very uh, suited with with QGIS uh, that use Earth observation data and they do specific analysis such as land classification. A plugin is called semi-automatic classification plugin, for example, that does this. There are more recent versions of QGIS than what's in this slide. So, and several releases are updated. This is quite a um, quite an updated software. So, there are several releases that are uh, that are you know uh, given to the public in a very uh, you know fast and timely way. Google Earth Engine it's a platform that I mentioned uh, before. Uh, this is very useful when we got to get access to Earth observation data and do processing without actually downloading it. So everything is stored into the Google uh, servers and uh, all the data that I described before, the publicly available data and the products, they're actually stored there. So we can download data, um, sorry, we can process data and we can see data without downloading. Eventually, we can also download it. But the good thing of the good thing of this platform is that it can actually allow an easy access to data without the need of of, of downloading. This is free for research, and uh, the website is, is is over there. It requires registration and requires a Google account. This was around public, you know, data access and processing, partially public. I think it's worth mentioning the EO browser and Sentinel Playground. Um, those are very user-friendly um, instruments to access Sentinel data and related products. There is a commercial offering here, so that's why it's partially public uh, for more advanced features. But generally speaking, basic features can be accessed for free. Uh, and we can see, for example, NDVI maps, moisture maps, and so on. Another, another partially public product is the Earth on AWS. So this is an on-demand cloud computing platform. So we move into cloud computing uh, and uh, there are several APIs linked to Earth observation data. Hello and welcome to the 101 Earth Observation Virtual Lecture Series. This series is delivered by the Satellite Applications Catapult in partnership with Wild Labs. This lecture is about the commercial world we have seen, uh, you know, till now, data 
that has been publicly available. This data is usually linked to certain resolution. Uh, the resolution that we see below the screen, no? So where we got like 30 meters, 10 meters, that's usually what we get with public data. But very often we need data that is actually at higher resolution, such as five meters or half a meter, or even, or even better than that. And this is usually part of the commercial world. So there are commercial providers that provide this sort of data. Here we see a list of, uh, of uh, uh, commercial providers and also public providers. There are several here and this list is not complete, uh, but we move from medium resolution constellation at about five meters resolution to very high resolution uh, constellation to uh, centimeter resolution and also SAR constellation um, in a, dif a different resolution. Again, we can go up to centime centimeter resolution. So there is a there is a nice resource here from the European Space Agency uh, with all with all those uh, providers. The source is like in the link over here, and uh, uh, alongside the links there are like links to uh, you know to, to get the data, links to the platform, and so on. This is called Newcomers Earth Observation Guide. Let's have a look at few 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 of them. So. There is a trend from, from the commercial world to move from, uh, uh, you know, simply download data to actually provide with platforms that uh, allow an easy use of the data of that specific provider, such as GTBX, which is a, from Maxar and is a cloud-based platform which allows users to build, access and run workflow to extract information from their imagery. They use uh, AWS, which I also explained in a previous video, and it's available in this slide, or Airbus with the One Atlas platform, which provides uh, access to optical and radar satellite imagery and associated services and uh, solutions. Or Planet, Planet, it's it's another it's another um, private company which has a constellation of optical uh, satellites that they provide data on a daily base everywhere on Earth at around five meter resolution, which is quite quite. Quite, quite unique. So they've got like a platform here to access their, their data and, uh, and, and related products. Another one here, uh, it's uh, Egeos from um, uh, the, the Italian Space Agency and, and Telespazio, which offers a wide selection of platform for services and, and, and so on, as well as this Cartas Lab, um, which is a platform uh, that is used to get data from actually here from both public and commercial sources and uh, uh, they create data that is you know ready for uh, ready for uh, analysis this closed this series of lectures uh, this specific lecture was a, a, a quick one on the on the commercial world and uh, you know I invite you to read the guide and to and to and to access like online resources to get more into it. Uh, but I wanted to mention as well, you know, the commercial world because it's an important part of, of, of remote sensing. This closed the series of lectures. So I thank you for, uh, for, for your attention. And uh, I hope that we have done like a journey through, uh, through Earth observation in, a, in an easy and like a sort of like uh, ways that is for, for, for beginners or for people that didn't have so much knowledge and hopefully now uh, they have a bit more knowledge of earth observation. So thank you again for your attention.